Welcome to The Question Show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down. I will gather them all up and I will answer them here. Uh, now, of course, I'm recording this show live on Monday, March 29th, 2021. So if some of my answers are hilariously out of date, it's because I cannot see into the future. I can only know the way the universe is today, and not the way the universe is going to be tomorrow. In theory, the Starship is going to attempt a flight with SN 11. Will it work? I don't know. Let's find out together. All right. Um, let's get into the questions. Branch, not to be a buzzkill, but how is it humane and ethical to send a crew of humans to Mars when they get radiated by the sun and cosmic rays for months, if not years, causing cognitive decline, significantly increasing the chance of cancer and the crew being isolated from their families and the rest of humanity. And to top it off, there is the real risk of the mission killing the crew almost immediately at any stage of the mission. So the question you're really asking is, is it ethical to explore when exploration is risky? And although sending a group of human beings to planet Mars and the new and unique risks that entails is new, uh, sending human beings to explore planet Earth and space is not something that's new. And that list of things like is it ethical to put a bunch of people onto a boat that's too small to have them attempt to go all the way around the earth when they could get scurvy and be killed by pirates and be eaten by a kraken or go down in a big storm every time that we explore beyond the safety and comfort of our own home we risk a little bit and some risks are worth taking. Uh, I don't know, getting on an airplane and going on a vacation to Japan. Other risks are not worth taking jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. There, there are exploration that you know, the outcome is almost certainly fatal. And then there is this gray area in between where if you take all of the precautions that you possibly can, you test very carefully, you put every single support and lifeline out available to you, and you take a risk, there is a chance that it will end badly, like somebody climbing a mountain, and there is a chance that it won't end badly. So this is like an ethical question that we and humanity has faced since we started exploring and will continue to face. Yes, going to Mars is an extremely unsafe activity. And the astronauts that volunteer to do this, understand the depth of the risks and the long term consequences. And you will have a lineup around the block of people willing to take that risk, understanding that it's going to shorten their lives, either in the long term or catastrophically. And that is just that's just how exploration works. So uh, is it ethical? Well, that's how we learn more about our place in the universe. And the people who take the risks, understand the consequences, and they choose to do it anyway, would I no way, I would absolutely not get on a spacecraft and fly to Mars. But nobody's forcing me to do that. So I think that when the time comes, when the precautions have been made when the technology has matured that people have decided that that we know as much as we can know about minimizing the risk, then that's the right time to do it. Julian Lawrence, I pray for another Carrington event. All right, so there's two ways that I can take this question. So I'm going to start with the more charitable version. And then I'm going to move on to the less charitable version. So the more charitable version is a Carrington event, an incredibly powerful solar storm will cause an auroral display the likes of which humanity has not seen for well over 100 years, almost 200 years, it'll be mind bending. It'll be day after day of all night long, Aurora activity in the north, and even into some of the mid latitudes places where people never get a chance to see auroras we will be able to go outside and all night long just watch the sky ablaze with purples and greens and blues and reds. And you know, I live in southern Canada, I've seen a couple of auroras and they're amazing. You can't even believe that it's real what you're seeing. It is not like the photographs. It is this, this 
living creature, this dragon that is charging around the sky. It's, it's hard to explain. And I wish that more people knew that this kind of an experience was available to them, that you could go out and you could see this with your own eyeballs. It will utterly change just the way you think about space or connection to the universe. It's like a, I don't know, it's like a reverse overview effect. It's amazing. And, and so unfortunately, because of the way the Earth's magnetosphere works, very few people ever get a chance to see an Aurora. But in this situation, um, with a really powerful solar storm, there are these few moments where we can. But don't wait for a don't wait for a Carrington event, wait uh, for a time that you can book a trip to go to Iceland, or northern Canada, or Scandinavia, and see an Aurora for yourself. It's absolutely worth doing. It's one of those bucket list items that you should be adding to your life. For the less charitable version, uh, are you saying that you can't wait for a devastating solar storm to ruin our electrical grid and take our satellites offline? Um, I don't think that's true. And I bet you, uh, if you've ever gone through multiple days of, of the power being out, you've experienced just a slight, just a glimpse of how much it sucks to lose our connection with each other through the internet, and how much we rely on power. And again, you know, as a Canadian, who grew up in the country, um, we both had a rural displays and frequent power outages. And yeah, when you can hear your, you know, food rotting in your freezer, because your power has been out for seven days, uh, it sucks. So uh, you do not want to have a Carrington event. You want to wait until people have woken up to the severity of the risk and uh, built a proper resilient infrastructure. Promise. I, you know, I promise you, you don't want it. User 1990. I have serious concerns about whether Starship is a legitimate product and not just a boondoggle to promote Elon Musk's profile, especially after seeing the content of Thunderfoot and Common Sense Skeptics debunking of SpaceX's principal claims. I think it's really important to put the developments that are going into Starship in perspective. Is Starship a massive structure made of stainless steel and Raptor engine sitting in the Texas coast? Yes. Have we watched Starship fly off the launch pad, perform some interesting maneuvers in the air and attempt to land safely back on Earth? Yes. Yes. Uh, now they've all exploded, which that's because the development of, of a new entirely new method of space travel is not going to work out in the beginning. Um, will it never work out? Like, like, we are just a few bad landing legs away from Starship as it's envisioned, doing the whole maneuver flying up, flipping over coming back down, flipping back into a vertical position and landing gently. It feels to me like this is an engineering problem that can be sorted out. The super heavy is another engineering challenge that can be sorted out. Um, so then the question is, is it going to be possible for the two to be put together and for the whole stack to launch to space for the super heavy to return to the launch pad and for starship to go to space and return back to earth? you know, doing an, an atmospheric uh, reentry. That is still an unsolved question right now. And you know, I've continuously said that I think that's going to be the greatest challenge. Can you actually bring that starship back through the Earth's atmosphere? And my guess is, is that it's not going to be as simple as Elon Musk and the engineering team think. But I also think that they're going to figure it out, they'll figure out some kind of solution to be able to make it. And the prize at the end of the road is a rocket that is able to fly to space and no part of it has to be thrown in the garbage. No, no part of it has to be, I guess it's called the Earth's atmosphere, the garbage. No part of it needs to be burned up in the Earth's atmosphere that the entire thing is reusable. And if the entire rocket is reusable, then that transforms the entire launch economy. Um, so when I when I think about the kinds of criticism that I see, it all seems to be very much on the periphery of what's being accomplished here. Like, 
oh, I'm not sure these things will actually be able to refuel in space. Well, refueling in space has been figured out. NASA has been able to do it. It's a matter of scaling it up. I don't think 100 people are going to be able to fly to Mars. Probably not. That sounds hard. I, I don't think we're ever going to want to send 100 people to Mars. But just because you don't end up sending 100 people to Mars doesn't mean that you haven't built a fully reusable rocket. Like a fully reusable rocket has an almost unlimited demand tomorrow for what it can accomplish. Um, it's going to be too loud. Well, maybe, um, you know, there are a lot of loud things that have happened. Uh, and people figure out how to live around loud things. Space shuttles were loud. The Saturn V was loud. Nuclear bombs are loud. Um, so we know that loud things can happen. The volcanoes are loud. So I think that there are a lot of criticisms that are valid. Because I think that that both Elon Musk, SpaceX, and a lot of just fans on the internet have just been have let their enthusiasm run away with them. And so they've been proposing all of these really um, extreme ideas for what the future would look like. But I mean, like, we watch Star Trek, we watch Star Wars, we watch science fiction, we think about the future. And just you know, I've mentioned this many times, that just because you think about the future doesn't mean that you're on the hook to actually implement it. The only part of of Starship so far that I think Elon Musk is is and SpaceX is on the hook for is developing a fully reusable two stage rocket system. And that's kind of it. Everything else is gravy at that point. And so I think that you can pretty safely debunk the debunk debunking, because all of that other stuff can either be easier than we thought harder than we thought, or never even be required. It doesn't matter. What matters is a fully reusable two stage rocket system. And right now where we stand today, we don't know if it's going to be possible. But every successful test that goes on, pushes the narrative pushes the 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 burden of evidence more in the direction that it's going to get figured out. Shreyam Fevro. I love how billions are spent on burning and blasts just to go to a distant planet while people on Earth are arguing, should we pay reparations to our minorities? Also, Elon Musk is the problem that America needs to fix now. Giving so much power to his company to waste those funds is shameful. And please stop hyping and we need to centralize SpaceX like NASA. So this sort of feels like the classic, why should we invest in space exploration when we have so many problems here on Earth? I think in this kind of situation, it's important to go back to first principles. Is spaceflight important? And I think I can give you plenty of examples that the answer to that question is yes. Look at Earth observing satellites, the ones that are out there in space right now observing the planet taking pictures, monitoring the state of our environment, we wouldn't know the state of our environment. If it wasn't for satellites, we wouldn't know the amount of greenhouse gases, we wouldn't be able to watch the changes to the ozone layer, we wouldn't be able to measure amounts of beachfront erosion due to climate change without satellites. Satellites provide us with with the ability to communicate with each other. Satellites allow us to be able to um, find our way around planet Earth um, using our GPS system and hundreds, thousands of other uh, applications. Is spaceflight important? Absolutely. So then the next question you ask, if you say that spaceflight is important, then you have to ask yourself, what's the best way to accomplish spaceflight? Does it make the most sense for it to be a a centralized government institution? Or does it make sense to have it be a free market? Uh, a free market economy? And I mean, we've seen this thing happen time and time again, does it make the most sense for the government to be the one that makes cars? Or does it make sense to have multiple manufacturers compete with each other? to be able to make cars happen uh, at lower prices, higher build quality, et cetera, et cetera. We know that the marketplace uh, that that capitalism to a certain extent does solve a lot of those problems. The, where capitalism goes wrong is that it essentially ignores externalities that when you uh, have a factory and you're dumping the toxic waste into a river, um, and you're not having to pay for that to clean that up when you're producing plastic and it's going to the oceans and you're not having to pay to have that plastic removing you're not actually experiencing the true cost of what it is that you're making. And so I think that we do a pretty bad job of 
factoring in externalities to what it is that we do. So I think that there is a role, there's a place for private companies to be able to build rockets and to launch them and to have customers who want to send these satellites to space. And the more, the lower you can bring those costs down, then the more interesting kinds of satellites that we can build. You could build a satellite that's only job is to detect certain kinds of pollution, or you could build a satellite that allows certain remote communities to be able to communicate. As the costs come down, and as long as you properly deal with the externalities, then that in theory should be a boon for humanity. So I think that as there's like a dramatic change in sort of the way humanity does what it does, there will people have this first mover advantage You had Elon Musk, Tesla. I mean, who wanted electric car companies 10 years ago, nobody. And so but here we are 10, 10 years later, and now everyone's chasing Elon Musk and Tesla to build electric cars, which will help reduce greenhouse gases. So I think that there is absolutely a place for companies to make these kinds of changes, rocket companies, um, car companies. And I think the, the mistake that's been made, and I really hope that the government stop this from happening, is that you get these externalities that the companies are able to dump pollution into our atmosphere and not have to pay for it, that they're able to produce plastic without considering what the long lifespan of it is. And I think we can all agree that if externalities are dealt with appropriately, then there's a role for the marketplace to work and do what it does best. And there's also a role for government. So um, yeah, I think this is this will be a, an argument that will be as old as time. Bren Whedon. Rosetta used five flyby gravity assists to reach its speed. Would it be possible to do more gravity assists, say 20 plus, and reach relativistic speeds? Do gravity assists require more fuel? A gravity assist works by you stealing the orbital velocity of a planet. And so I'll give you an example, right? You want to fly Voyager towards Jupiter and use that to give you a gravity assist. So you fly the spacecraft to Jupiter, it falls into Jupiter's gravity well, and then Jupiter essentially accelerates the spacecraft in orbit to match its orbital velocity. And then you fly out of the gravity well, and now you've stolen a tiny little bit of Jupiter's orbital velocity. And now you're going significantly faster because Jupiter was way more massive than your little spacecraft. And you can do multiple gravity assists. Each one speeds up your spacecraft a little bit more. So is there a practical limit? Yeah, there is a practical limit, which is that you're you can only go so fast as the escape velocity of the solar system. So to give you an example, the escape velocity of the solar system from the sun is about 43 kilometers per second. And so if you are flying past the Earth, you are going already 30 kilometers per second. So if you add another 15 kilometers per second in velocity, you can't come back to do another gravity assist. So that's going to be the limitation. Uh, the other limitation is that you do require a little bit of fuel when you're going to do a gravity assist. But that's not a, a huge deal. So really, you're limited by the number of objects that are nicely lined up for you to be able to do flyby after flyby after flyby until you can use them all. And so that's why the Voyagers did this, uh, this maneuver back in the, you know, when they were flying past the great planets, all of the big planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune were lined up perfectly. And so Voyager could do this increasingly fast flyby as it flew out of the solar system. And if it could, it could go past Pluto, and then maybe it could go past Eris, you know, you could maybe have everything nicely lined up. Um, but there's that's the limit, because you're already you're already on escape velocity trajectory, and you can't do it. So in theory, um, if you had like a bunch of black holes scattered across the Milky Way, you could do flybys of black holes, and eventually you would reach Milky Way escape velocity, which is like, I don't know, like 250 kilometers a second. And then you would be skipped out of the Milky Way itself. So theoretically, if you could get close enough to the singularity of a black hole, you could you could go to relativistic speeds. But practically, it's, you know, not not really possible. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Slack Slack, Christopher Shogger, Jonathan Patrick, Mick Atten, Jeffrey Qualls, Avery Peck, and the rest of our 849 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. 
Bill Sugden. Any use for satellites with small 30 to 40 centimeter telescopes? Now small payloads are getting cheaper. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's a Canadian telescope called Most, and they call it the Humble Space Telescope. And it's like suitcase sized and has a little telescope on board. And it's used to find exoplanets. So when you think about sort of all the electronics, yeah, if you attached a fairly small telescope, 30, 40 cent centimeters is, is not bad. Uh, you know, it looks about a foot, right? Uh, with a chip, with a nice CCD sensor and put it out into space, that would do the trick. In fact, I don't think that TESS is much bigger than 30 to 40 centimeters. Even the, the, the telescope on board TESS is pretty small. So I love this idea of smaller satellites with very specific purposes, tuned to a very specific wavelength, or trying to solve one very specific scientific problem, as opposed to booking time on a great big telescope. I love these ideas of having small pathfinding observatories that at least just sort out whether or not there is any there there. And then you can book time on the big telescope. Think about what's happening with TESS. TESS is finding, it's already found, I think today we heard that they found over 2,000, 2,200 exoplanet candidates so far. Now, TESS isn't a very big telescope, and it's not going to be able to tell us anything more about them. But you can hand these off to ground-based and space-based observatories to continue the observations. TESS is the finder scope for the James Webb Space Telescope. So I love this idea of lots more finder scopes for other issues, binary stars, supernova, galaxy lensing, gravitational micro lensing, there's lots of great ideas that you can use these small telescopes for. And who knows, maybe you're going to have like a starship fly with 100 of these small satellites, which each one has only one job, you know, one could just look at Alpha Centauri and say, are there any planets at Alpha Centauri and just observe Alpha Centauri 24 seven. So um, decreased launch costs will open up a revolution in what we can do in terms of, of space science. HQ cart. What does it take to send an object into space and make it stand still, meaning that it's not moving with the solar system, galaxy and not even space expansion? It's not possible because there is no objective reference frame that you could measure standing still. I'm sorry, standing still. Um, uh, you always have to ask yourself moving compared to what? Like right now you're sitting in your chair. And so you're not moving with relation to your chair. But depending on what continent you live on, you are moving with relation to another continent because it is drifting away from you or towards you at a centimeter a year, you are moving at 30 kilometers per second with the earth as it goes around the sun, you're moving at 220 kilometers per second, as it moves around the Milky Way. And so you could always figure out a way to change your velocity so that you are not moving with relation to something else. But then you will be moving with relation to something else. And if you're going to try to stop based on one part of the sky, you're going to be moving based on another part of the sky. So there's really no way that you could just be standing still, you will always be moving in relation to something else. Johnny G. Are there any serious contenders in the private sector other than space explorers that are making great strides in rocket technology? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely got rocket lab, which is launching smaller rockets, they have plans to launch bigger rockets. Um, you're looking at some airplane based launch facilities like what Virgin Orbit is doing, which is kind of an interesting idea because you can take off from a regular commercial runway with a jet fly down to the equator, which is the best place to launch a rocket, launch a rocket, have it go to space, have your airplane come back and land nice and safely. So those are going to help fill in part of the gap on the small end of the launch rocket, if you really need a rocket to go to your very specific trajectory. But at the larger scale, and you know, there's some there's some companies and I forget the name is it vector space, there's some companies that are that are building rocket engines using say 3d printers. Um, there's a rocket company or a company called spin launch, which is figuring out whether or not you can use um, essentially centripetal force, you can sort of spin up a launcher and then release it, and then use that as part of the energy to get it up into into space. Um, you know, there's a lot of good ideas. But 
none of them are as evolved currently as what Blue Origin and SpaceX are working on. And none of them have the opportunity to make as dramatic a change as Starship will if they're able to crack a fully two stage reusable rocket. And in fact, the thing that I think is more troubling is how little the rest of the launch companies are taking what's happening with Starship. Um, I think you're starting to see now say Europe with Ariane space saying we need to figure out some degree of reusable space flight, like they're thinking about competing with Falcon nine at this point, uh, China is doing something similar, Russia has its plans. And so all the various rocket companies United Launch Alliance um, are considering responses to Falcon nine, but nobody is considering a response to Starship. And that's sort of where you have to go, you have to think about what the future like what replaces Starship? That's the question that you should be asking yourself if you're a launch company right now, if you want to stay relevant in the future. Sean Marson. Hey, Fraser, does Mars proximity to asteroid belt increase its danger of encountering an asteroid strike? Do we have current data about recent impacts? The danger that you face from an asteroid impact really comes from the amount of gravity that you have. And so Earth has more gravity than Mars. And so we distort the orbits of more objects than Mars does. Mars is definitely closer to the asteroid belt. Um, Jupiter is on the other side and Jupiter is really the cause of the asteroid belt, the objects falling out of the asteroid belt and moving inwards into the inner solar system. And it's constantly pushing asteroids out of the asteroid belt and shoving them into the inner solar system. And they spend some time going past Mars, and they spend some time going past Earth. The cool thing about Mars is that the there is this record written onto the face of Mars that shows us every single asteroid impact that's ever hit the planet, and in what order, and um, which is pretty amazing. And so you can go and count asteroid impacts on Mars and figure out when they happen and where and which which ones came first. And this asteroid fell into that this crater was created inside that crater and so on and so forth. But uh, no, not that I'm aware of that Mars has an increased chance. If anything, it's lower gravity, you would expect to essentially attract less asteroids than Earth does. Visto Tutti, do you think the Lunar Gateway Station would be more important to science than boots on the moon themselves? I kind of do. Well, it's gonna get me in trouble with Bob Zubrin. So make sure he doesn't watch this video. Because um, he thinks that the Lunar Gateway is a lunar toll booth, I think. Yeah, I think the Lunar Gateway is a very important next step for human spaceflight. What the Lunar Gateway lets you do is try to keep human beings alive in a place that is more difficult than low Earth orbit. At this point with the International Space Station, we've mastered keeping human beings alive in low Earth orbit, I think. Uh, and the next step is to keep them alive on high Earth orbit. And what the Lunar Gateway lets you do is it lets you break up a mission to the moon into a couple of pieces, you fly to orbit, uh, or you fly to the lunar gateway, and then you go onto the lunar gateway, and then you fly to and from the surface of the moon. And the problem with the Apollo missions back in the day was that it was sort of like a all the way to the moon, all the way back and no infrastructure. And that's the problem. If you build a lunar gateway, then you have infrastructure, then you have a place that you can send people to, you can dock spacecraft, you can build up more spacecraft, you can transfer fuel, you can transfer food and so on. And it gets easier and easier to get down to the surface of the moon. And actually, there was a uh, an article that we just posted on universe today today, um, as I'm recording this about a like, it should be possible to have a single stage lunar ferry boat. So you have the lunar gateway, you have people taking say, uh, dragon capsules to and from the lunar gateway. And then you got just one vehicle that can go from the gateway down to the surface of the moon. Astronauts can do their job on the surface of the moon and the thing can fly back up with the fuel remaining on board and dock with the International Space Station. So it's like the same idea as Starship that how can we make these missions work without having to throw everything away every time? Uh, the fact that right now a dragon flies to the International Space Station with cargo 
the astronauts fill it with garbage, it returns back to the Earth, it gets filled back up with more cargo and sent back to the International Space Station on a reusable Falcon 9 rocket like, like reusability is is should be the goal for the next step of what we do in space like, like, okay, we know we can make it to space and build a space station by throwing away an enormous amount of equipment, rockets, gear, etc. Can we do it without throwing things away? That's the next question. And that's what I think the Lunar Gateway allows us to do. Um, I don't think the Lunar Gateway is a great tool for going to Mars. That's not its job. And so if you try to sell the Lunar Gateway as like, this is your gateway to go to Mars or the asteroid belt. No, it is a place that you can go as a way station before you go back down to the moon and then back up and then back to Earth. And so I think part of the frustration that we all have is that that we went to the moon and then we never went back and we didn't go back. See, I did it again. <laughs> and we didn't go back because we never we didn't leave any infrastructure at all. And so this time around, that's what I want to see infrastructure. And the way you do that is with something like the Lunar Gateway, small space station that allows you to dock, store ferries that go up and down from the moon and build from there. Nick Poshek. As a science communicator, how frustrating is it when telescope names like LSST and W first get changed? I think the new names are great, but for the longest time, I thought there were other new projects. I love it. I love when they get their name. We're so familiar now with the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb and, and all of these different missions that have happened in the past. And I think it's fantastic that they get named after someone, Kepler, Tycho, there's, there's all these famous astronauts and Vera Rubin, right? Nancy Grace Roman. Um, there are all of these people who have made these really significant impacts in our understanding of the cosmos and for them to get a spacecraft or an observatory named after them allows that name to kind of re enter our, our lexicon and we just get to use it over and over again. Like, would we all know who Hubble was as much? If we didn't think about the Hubble Space Telescope, I don't think so. Nobody would know who James Webb was if we didn't talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. So I think it's fantastic. I love it. And no, I have no problem learning the new names, um, especially when you know someone who you've, you're a big fan of gets a name. Like I've been waiting for someone to give a Vera Rubin named spacecraft or observatory. And so the fact that it went to LSST, which is like my favorite observatory, is so great. No, no way. Fugal Creations. Do you think that we could find a way to accelerate at around 1G like in the expanse for prolonged spaceflight? No. No, I can't imagine any technology in the near future apart from like antimatter that would allow us to accelerate at 1G for long periods of time. Like the expanse is amazing. Best science fiction television show ever made the the rocket system, the rocket engine in the expanse is magic. It is Gandalf smog level of magic. It is it is Iron Man uh, magic. And so no, once again, science fiction has ruined our expectations. But at least it's not like teleportation, or like a small device that you hold in your hand that allows you to communicate with other people. That's madness. So no, no, unfortunately, I think it'll be, it'll be a very long time before like maybe metallic hydrogen, but not even that. No, it's gonna be a long time. Space flight is gonna suck for a long time. David cams, we often hear that a small piece of stellar material would weigh millions of tons. But is it the weight that's the cause of the gravity produced by the star? Or would it really weigh that much? That's a great that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the sun is made of hydrogen and helium and down at the core, the density of this material is incredibly high. It is like metal it is it is in, insanely dense and hot. And so it would I don't know if it would weigh millions of tons, but it would be very heavy. Um, but if you just took that stuff and you brought it to Earth atmosphere and just let it go, it would just be turned into this, it would be incredibly undense and it would, you could fill a balloon with it and it would float around. So, uh, so yeah, it's sort of like the density of the object is all depends on where it is. Same thing with a white dwarf, you know, they say like, that just a cup full of it is weighs however many tons. 
Um, and again, that's because the atoms are mashed together incredibly densely. But if you just had that same crystalline structure, it's like a diamond. It's not that heavy. Um, I'll bet you a neutron star would be similar. So it's the, the fact that you've got the gravity holding the material together with that level of density, that amount of matter compacted into that small of volume is what creates the weight and the mass. So yeah, if you took it away from where it was, but you try that like good luck, you pull a little bit of the sun, sun's core away from the sun and, and release it into into the Earth's atmosphere. Walter's world. So the great attractor has us in its grips. Is there something that's past the great attractor that is pulling the great attractor? It was always funny. The great attractor is I don't know, I feel like it's my nemesis here on the channel because it's like I trot it out as an example of a very solved mystery. What is the great attractor, which is obscured by the zone of avoidance. But the reality, of course, is that we've known what the great attractor is for a long time, the great attract because we have tel space telescopes that allow us to see through the gas and dust that obscure the core of the Milky Way and show us the galaxies that are on the other side of the Milky Way that are causing everything to be pulled in that general direction. Um, but what's gotten more interesting is just as the power of our telescopes have gotten better and better, we're starting to map out the larger structure, the larger gravitational influence of all of the galaxy clusters that are in our area. And so back in the day, we thought we were part of the Virgo supercluster. And now we know that we're part of this much larger structure called the Lanakea supercluster. And so we are in the outskirts, and that the actual core, the gravitational core of it is happens to be in the direction direction of the core of the Milky Way, it's on the other side. And just bad luck has it in a place that we have a hard time observing it with regular Earth based telescopes, but space telescopes, um, infrared observatories can radio telescopes can help us see through all that and see what it is. And the thing that's kind of interesting is sort of like hard to say, like, what is a thing in space? What is a, you know, the all of the galaxies in the local group, Andromeda, M33, all of the small galaxies, they're all going to come together into one big mega galaxy. But beyond that, the galaxies in the Virgo supercluster, they are moving away from each other, and will be carried away faster and faster and faster. And they're never actually going to merge as a single object, you couldn't get to 96% um, of the galaxies that we can see in the universe, they're going to fall over the cosmic horizon, and they're going to be gone forever. There is no way even if you could travel the speed of light, you wouldn't be able to reach them. And that includes many of the galaxies that are part of the Lanakea supercluster. And so these parts of this giant thing that is gravitationally bound to itself is also sort of getting blown apart as the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And so it will never actually form a thing. But but between then and now it still acts like a gravitational over density in the universe, which is causing various galaxies to slide in that general direction. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you'll want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights and links so you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universe today.com slash audio or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to everyone watching here on Twitch and everyone who asked a question. And if you want to ask a question for an upcoming show, you can post it in the YouTube comments or Patreon, or you can join me live on my YouTube channel every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always, Chad Weber, Nancy Graziano.